Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, my privilege and pleasure to be the patron of uh, military history and heritage Victoria. My name is Jim Barry, and uh, I see on the program I'm to do the opening. You, when you get one of these programs, you often find out what's well, quite interesting. So hence the opening. The, uh, what I would like to do is say uh, our organisation's been around for a while now. We were officially launched back in May of 2011 by the good Professor Geoffrey Blaney. And we've kept almost up on the wall uh, what he said to us in the brief, which was he challenged us to be relevant. And one of the things that I've been pleased about as a patron in observing the works of the committee and putting together these sorts of conferences is that I think uh, that we've managed that very well, particularly through conferences such as today. Because for the record, this is our 17th conference in some 12 years. And, that, uh, and as I said, I think we've handled it pretty well. All right. And also for the record, as I said, 17 such activity. But I guess, let me go back to this conference because it's very important and it relates to the title above. Defenders of the Queen, or more appropriately, I think, Imperial and Colonial Defence of the Region. Of the Region is not in there, and that will come out during this particular period of 1850 through to Federation 1901. The, uh, the conference covers, in my view, a most, I don't like using the word unique, but I think it's a period of our history that's had very, very little attention, and we believe that this conference covers that important issue. Probably one of the most overlooked areas of our military history. Anyway, some of which will be disturbing, I think, but needs to be addressed. And it might be that this was, the committee was in, influenced by the work, work up towards the, the uh, voice referenda. Maybe, I could be wrong. I believe they've convened a balanced but well diversified program for you and certainly with an excellent cast of presenters. But I would just like to acknowledge a few people if I may. And the one that I enjoyed was walking past those scarlet jackets over there. <laughs> those two guys are going to stay here till morning tea. So if any of you would like a photograph with them to prove to those at your home that you are here, <laughs> please make sure you do it. Uh, and thank you guys. Uh, Victorian Colonial Infantry. I think that's, I've got the title right. I think that's yes, what sir. they are. Okay. Uh, the other thank yous and acknowledgements is obviously this RSL at Waverley uh, have looked after us extremely well over the years. But there were other people that uh, sponsored us in many different ways. And uh, they would, I'd like to just acknowledge Big Sky Publishing, the National Archives for the display that is here, and also uh, Echo Books and its associated companies for its support of what we've been doing. And I finally would like to just thank and acknowledge the convener of this diversified program, <coughs> Dr. Andrew Kilsby, who will also be presenting after lunch at what I think is an interesting balancing act to cover, as I said, this rather difficult uh, topic. And may I also 
uh, thank you, the delegates, for attending, and I trust you enjoy the day. I'm certainly looking forward to it. And uh, as always, may I introduce our immediate past president, Colonel Marcus Fielding, retired, uh, to be the first session chair to commence proceedings. Marcus, please join me at the lectern so that I can go and rest. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, lovely to see you all here on Sunday morning. The sun's out, so it's good that we're inside and not taking advantage of that. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce our keynote speaker, Craig Wilcox. Craig completed his doctorate at ANU, and his doctoral thesis was on Australia's citizens' army between 1889 and 1914. His work at the Australian War Memorial has held a fellowship at the Menzies Centre for Australian Studies in London, and is an honorary associate of the Centre for Historical Research at the National Museum of Australia. He wrote the entry on historian Charles Bean for the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography in 2006, a, uh, an honour that uh, deserves to go on your CV by all means. And his published, published books include For Hearths and Homes, Citizen Soldiering in Australia, 1854 to 1945, Australia's Boer War, Red Coat Dreaming, How Colonial Australia Embraced the British Army, Home Front, Australians in <laughs> World War I, A Kind of Victory, Charles Cox and His Australian Cavalrymen, Badge, Boot and Button, The Story of Australian Uniforms, and finally, Australia's Tasman Wars, Colonial Australia and Conflict in New Zealand from 1800 to 1850. So, well qualified to speak today. His current project is on a history of the Sydney suburb of Erskineville, so a little off the military history topic, but uh, I'm sure a lot of fun nonetheless. Craig, welcome, and we'd like to introduce you. My eyesight is so terrible having written all those books that I have to hold the paper up like that, so please forgive me. It doesn't look very good, but it at least works. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I think it proves that if you just sit around writing all day, um, eventually it does amount to something. Um, but um, <laughs> yes, I, I could have perhaps done something more useful with life. Um, I've got to say that it's a, it's a real honor to be holding the opening slot at the conference. But it's a problem as well, isn't it? I mean, what can I say that might serve to open the proceedings? You'll see the original idea I had in the conference program, but when I sketched out that idea in detail, it turned into 40 minutes of me telling you what we ought to be working on. So it was a bit boring, or so my wife told me, and it was also a little ungracious as well. So I thought of something slightly more interesting to do. What I'll do instead is talk about my recent book, Australia's Tasman Wars, not, thank God, to summarise it, but especially, and especially because it focuses. Please do. Oh, great, that, oh, that's much better then. Thank you. Um, especially because it focuses on the years 1800 to 1850, the long <coughs> half century from the point of view of this conference. Instead, I'll describe how I got from an initial idea to the eventual book. That path takes us through some interesting writing on Australian military history of the second part of the 19th century, and it does point to some serious gaps in our knowledge. I'll describe the possibilities I think, or I hope, the book opens up for new research and writing. To my mind, a whole vista we might categorise as maritime frontier conflict can open up to us, plus a way to reconsider Australian inland frontier conflict, that growth, sent, that growth sector of Australian military history, and also of military myth-making. The story starts, well, a bit more than a decade ago, when Craig Stockings and John Connor at the Australian Defence Force Academy assembled three collections of deceptively easy-to-read essays on aspects of Australian military history, 
You might have come across them, and the first book notoriously had the word zombie in its title. Um, yeah, I know it, but at least it got attention. <laughs> Some people here were contributors to the books. Andrew Killsby on Rifle Clubs, Greg Blake on Eureka. I wrote about Break and Morant, Expeditionary Wars, and the build-up to the First World War. <clears throat> A lot was left out, though, including from the decades we're focusing on today. Where were the volunteers of the 1850s and 1860s? Where was the occupation of Beijing in 1900? Still, the books packed a punch. One idea in them in particular stuck in my mind, the artificiality of separating the military histories of colonial Australia and colonial New Zealand. These lands were intricately linked as British colonies. Troops left Eastern Australia to fight against Maori in the 1840s and 1860s. Sure, New Zealand kept out of the Federation, but that was a bit of a surprise. And anyway, there were joint preparations for the First World War. So I decided to write something that would further erode the artificial barrier formed by the Tasman Sea and by decades of insular history writing on both sides of it. At first, I dug into the mid-19th century military force, variously known as enrolled pensioners or fencibles, <coughs> British Army veterans who were enticed into part-time garrison duty around the empire in return for cottages and land. Now their New Zealand service is well known. We have the bones of their Western Australian service thanks to Frank Broomhall's massive compendium titled The Veterans, and also to archaeological work, very interesting work too, on pensioner cottages in WA. But we lack an, an Australasian overview of what was an important military force and also migrant group. But I eventually gave the pensioners away. What was really needed wasn't so much as an Australasian history of them, but a global history, tackling them in the UK as well as the dozen or so colonies they went to, from the Falkland Islands to the Cape of Good Hope. I found that too hard to get my grain head around, and it was too expensive to research. In any case, by 2016, I discovered Jeff Hawkins Weiss's thesis and book on the Australian angle to the New Zealand wars. Those two monographs, the thesis and the book, formed the first scholarly study of Australian involvement in the New Zealand wars. Wars in which the British garrison crossed from here over the Tasman to fight, arms, supplies and thousands of militiamen and settlers followed them, and Australian colonists back home emotionally mobilised for and against conflict. Now here was real drama laid out by Jeff in clear prose based on careful research. And here also, I thought, was a way to link our narratives of expeditionary war and frontier war. I'll say a little about that. Now, for obvious reasons, the focus of Australian military history since the 1920s has been expeditionary war. But a second focus came in the 1970s when clashes between Indigenous Australians and settlers began to be reconceptualised as a frontier war. Those two narratives, expeditionary war and frontier war, have barreled on since then, largely separate for the past 50 years, usually written by historians with very different backgrounds, interests and agendas. Can those narratives be mingled? At least, can expeditionary war and frontier war be shown to have influenced each other in some way? Is there a link? <coughs> Sam Hutchinson's interesting study called Settlers, War and Empire in the Press, a book published in 2018, argued for influence. He dug up plenty of comment from Australian newspapers from the second half of the 19th century, saying that if Australians failed to support British wars in New Zealand and South Africa, that was going to cast doubt as the Hobart Mercury put it, on our aptitude for reclaiming and settling the waste places of this earth. In other words, some colonial Australians sensed that their hold on Australia was tenuous and challengeable in some kind of way, and felt that supporting the British colonial project elsewhere, by barracking from a distance or sending expeditionary forces, forces when they were asked to, was a way to affirm the British colonial project within Australia to affirm their tenure here. Now, I don't necessarily buy that argument, 
But Sam Hutchinson found plenty of evidence that Australian colonists reflected on their occupation of a continent while they were aiding colonists during wars in other British lands. Jeff Hopkins Weiss's approach to bringing the two narratives of expeditionary war and frontier war closer was a different one, more direct, and I think it was more successful. By showcasing troops and militia leaving Australia to fight a neighbouring Indigenous people in New Zealand in the 1840s and again in the 1860s, Jeff brought those two strands close together. And by focusing on the 1860s, he left room for more work in the half century before that. So there was a chance for me to explore the gradual transition from small scale scuffles in, 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 of, um, from early, in, in, oh, I've got that mixed up, small scale scuffles of early New Zealand frontier conflict to the full scale stand up combat of formal war between regulars and Maori in the 1840s. And a lot of that was an Australian story. From around 1800, there were one-off, two-bit clashes between Maori and civilians, usually based in Australia. Traders, whalers, sealers, missionaries. Clashes that were similar in nature and scale, the frontier conflict in Australia. By the mid-1840s, British troops from Australia were going into battle against Maori stockades. And the casualties were sometimes heavy. On one day in 1845, 34 soldiers were killed and 63 wounded. So here I figured, when looking for a focus for my book, was a continuum between the kind of war focused on by frontier conflict historians and the kind of war focused on by expeditionary war historians. All that remained for me was to look into all the nooks and crannies, all the twists and turns, and write a detailed account of Australian participation in early New Zealand frontier conflict. <coughs> As I guess everyone here is finding, a lot of the sources were digitised by the time I began my research. But there were also fact bundles of paper documents in the New South Wales archives that almost no one had ever trawled through. And what a valuable trove that was. I found files on New Zealand that were kept year by year during the 1830s and 1840s by the New South Wales Colonial Secretary. Also yearly files labelled military that focused on the mounted police. There were also colonial secretary letter books to military and naval officers. But so many records of what was happening in New Zealand were held in Sydney was an indicator that Sydney had once been the British regional capital, not just for Eastern Australia, but for across the Tasman as well. But I've got to confess that, as Jeff seems to have found, and maybe all of us are finding, digitised colonial newspapers tend to reveal more even than official records. One thing that struck me as I got into my research was the importance of arms dealing, weapons trading, legal gun running, if you like. As readers or writers of Australian military history, we don't much think about selling weapons because it wasn't a thing on the inland frontier. But it was quite a thing in New Zealand, New Guinea and in the Pacific. During the first half of the 19th century, Specially manufactured trade muskets were shipped from Birmingham to Sydney in their thousands each year for exchange with Polynesian and Melanesian chiefs. Then, in the second half of the century, came rifles into Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane for the same kind of trade. I was struck by the scale of that trade, by its use to cement commercial alliances between Australian traders and local chiefs. And by the way that weapons fuel fighting between Indigenous people that dragged in traders, missionaries, and sometimes even colonial governments. We badly knew the history of Australian gun running, legally or otherwise. I was also struck while I was working by how little we still know about the British garrison in Australia. We have Peter Stanley's insightful summary, The Remote Garrison, published back in 1986, I think. And we have some great studies of individual regiments, but we like a hefty volume to match John Bark's volume on the Royal Navy's Australia Station. Nor is there a collective data-driven project like the one in New Zealand called Soldiers of Empire, which considers the British garrison as a major population and migrant group, or it did consider it until it ran out of steam or maybe funding a few years ago. Nor do we know about the British garrison's command in Australia, it had a writ that ran from 
Perth over to New Zealand. From the 1830s, it was headed by a separate commander-in-chief who wasn't also a governor, or mostly a governor. The generals who held that position, from Morris O'Connell in the 1840s to Trevor Shute in the 1860s, all lacked biographers. I was so frustrated by that that I sketched out a mini, a mini biography myself of Morris O'Connell's military command, which was published a few years ago in the Journal of the Royal Australian Historical Society. And I hope it will be followed by other and deeper studies of men who were unknown predecessors of the colonial commoners of the last quarter of the 19th century. Men we don't know everything about, but we do know a lot more about. Looking into the early Australian involvement in violence in New Zealand with its arms dealing and eventual dispatch of British regiments from here, seemed to say new things to me about Australian military history. But I soon figured that what I was looking into, and, and others before me had seen, was a, a, a kind of new dimension into Australian frontier war. It's as far back as 1966 that the academic journal now called Australian Historical Studies, published the historian John Young's observation that the early British lodgements in Eastern Australia had two frontiers, an inland one, but also a maritime one. Some of the first Britons in Australia used those early lodgements as bases to push not only inland, but also across the sea to New Zealand and to all the islands of Melanesia and Polynesia. It was a long, confused, episodic push by whalers and sealers, traders and missionaries, runaways and blackbirders, followed by the soldiers, sailors and officials who sometimes had to clean up after these intruders or protect them. Now the point of that push, unlike the push inland, wasn't at first to grab land. It was to escape authority sometimes, or far more often, it was to make money by selling guns, by whaling and sealing, by fishing for sea cucumber or buying sandalwood, by cornering supplies of flax and timber. And there was also an ideological project of conversion by the missionaries, preaching not just about a God who came to earth and died on a cross, but also about the virtues of discipline and work. Because New Zealand and the Pacific formed a commercial and ideological frontier for colonial Australia, and not a zone of settlement, that meant there was less at stake whenever there was violence on that frontier. And of course there was violence. Frontiers by nature are violent, simply because a single powerful authority doesn't operate there. And the violence, when it happened, could be intense indeed. Melanesian and Polynesian societies valued battle as much as European ones did. And the weapons trade ensured that almost every man was well armed. Then there was the use of naval patrols out of Sydney and later Brisbane to impose order on both sides. Warships firing broadsides and landing marines were a much heavier instrument of control than the handful of mounted police who used to ride out on the inland Australian frontier. Let's have a quick look at one small incident from the 1850s, which is sometimes called the Oliver Affair. In 1852, a trading ship owned by Robert Towns, the guy who Townsend was named after, anchored off a place called Canalo in New Caledonia to buy sandalwood from local chiefs. But collecting sandalwood was supposed to be under taboo, taboo at that time of year. After idling for a couple of months waiting, the ship's master, John Oliver, sailed five miles to a nearby native community that was in conflict with Canalo. He invited chiefs and women on board his ship, which was a usual kind of thing, but this time one of the visitors was shot dead and the rest were held captive. Oliver then sailed his ship back to Kanala and traded the captives he had for 40 or 50 tons of sandalwood. <laughs> when the ship returned to Sydney, Robert Towns was furious. Yep, he had a rich cargo of sandalwood that he promptly arranged to sell in China, but the fate of the captives must have been terrible and taking sides between native people restricted future trading opportunities. In Towns' eyes, what John Oliver had done was worse than immoral. It was bad for business. Towns hauled some of the crew before a Sydney magistrate, and he appealed to Everett Home, commander of the Royal Navy ships in Australia, to go out to Canala to help obtain evidence for a prosecution. <coughs> but Home had better things to do with his warships at the time, and Oliver fled from Sydney. 
And that was the end of the Oliver Affair, apart from briefly becoming another byword for relations on the maritime frontier. It was a typical small clash, hard to notice sometimes, um, typical too in how its consequences were debated in Sydney. Now I'm not saying that violence like the Oliver Affair is unknown to us. There are some pretty good histories of moments of it, of aspects of it. The Oliver Affair was covered pretty well in Dorothy Scheinberg's book, They Came for Sandalwood, the history of the Pacific sandalwood trade and the violence that accompanied it, published way back in 1967. But occurring outside Australian national borders, violence like this has been left to historians of the Pacific, like Dorothy Scheinberg, to interpret, or to New Zealand and PNG historians, and to the people of NZ, New Guinea, and Pacific nations to inherit to ponder, to own, to keep to themselves. I think it's time to see that as part of Australian military history too. Now, what would it look like if we did, if we did incorporate, incorporate maritime frontier conflict into our military history and had to give it a kind of overview, a quick sort of thumbnail sketch? Well, I think it would look like this, if you look very broadly. We look at three different zones of conflict which for the moment we could just label after points of the compass. Southeast, near north, northeast. Let's go to the southeast zone first, where conflict began just beneath Australia, with French navigators and American sealers, not indigenous people, being nudged out of Bass Strait around 1800. Now I'm not sure about this, but war against Tasmania's indigenous people around 1830 might be seen as part of this southeast zone of maritime frontier conflict, since it was a consequence of annexing and occupying an island, Tasmania, that was hundreds of miles from Sydney, and which, when you think about it, was no more or less naturally part of Australia then than New Zealand was. But the number of southeast zone conflict was New Zealand. Clashes on ships and on land between Maori and traders and other intruders from Australia into New Zealand were frequent there from the 1790s to the 1830s. But a massive musket trade also cemented alliances <coughs> between intruders and indigenous people. When New Zealand was briefly annexed to New South Wales in 1840, conflict in this southeast zone put on uniform. British troops were sent from Sydney as a garrison and Sydney and Hobart became rear bases for the New Zealand wars of the 1840s and the 1860s. But as that happened, as serious war was flaring up, the British base and command centre moved from Australia to New Zealand itself. Frontier conflict in New Zealand in the 1860s ceased to be part of an Australian frontier conflict. Although, as Jeff has shown, it, was very, it remained very much a part of Australian expeditionary war. The second zone, the North Zone, maritime frontier conflict was at first confined to the waterway between Australia and what's now Indonesia. Military garrisons were posted to Australia's north in the 1820s and 1830s to safeguard that waterway, to foster trade and assert Britain's claim to all of Australia. Wrecked or anchored ships were vulnerable to attack by Torres Strait Islanders and that prompted a punitive expedition there from Sydney in 1836. But conflict in that zone became routine only in the 1870s as miners and missionaries trickled out of Queensland and into PNG. In the 1880s, Eastern New Guinea was divided between Germany and Britain, or rather Britain's Australian colony. Not for another 30 years would there be a war between imperial contenders for New Guinea though. Until then, the typical clashes were massacres of native people and attacks on isolated white men and bloody police actions in response, or simply asserting colonial rule. <clears throat> the conquest of German New Guinea in 1914 was the first formal military clash on Australia's North Maritime Frontier since, or, or on all the Maritime Frontier really, since the 1840s wars against Maori and New Zealand. But far bigger though was the defence of New Guinea during the Second World War. Now we don't <coughs> usually think of that as keeping a rival power out of our maritime frontier, but maybe we should. So the third and last zone, the northeast zone of maritime frontier conflict, was a consequence of traders and missionaries pushing out from Australia to Tahiti and Tonga, Fiji and other Pacific islands during the first half of the 19th century. At the same time, so also pushing into New Zealand. And like in New Zealand, conflict in this zone included attacks on ships, 
alliances with Indigenous people and policing by Navy ships based in Sydney. The North East Zone extended across thousands of miles, wherever a ship from Australia ventured, even to Japan, incredibly enough, when some whalers from New South Wales attacked a fort and burnt down a village in Hokkaido in 1831. A rush of settlers from Australia to Fiji in the 1860s brought on clashes like those on the inland frontier or in New Zealand and encouraged talk of annexing Fiji. And there was also a new weapons trade related to the co-opting of island labourers into Queensland. But the Pacific was ceasing to be a frontier for Australians. Britain and rival powers were now annexing its islands, handing the management of conflict to local colonial administrations. We sent a couple of small expeditions to help the New Guineas, oh, sorry, the New Hebrides administration crush native descent during the First World War, but that was a throwback to earlier times. Or maybe, when you think about it, it was poised halfway between the punitive expeditions sent from Sydney to New Zealand and the Torres Strait in the first half of the 19th century and more recent peacekeeping efforts in the Solomons. Now, to repeat, I'm not saying the individual count encounters among all this violence are unknown. They just haven't been claimed by Australian military historians as part of their purview too, and understood as a maritime theatre of Australian frontier conflict. I think maritime frontier conflict changes how we understand inland frontier conflict as well. Sometimes the only martial activity that non-military historians see in 19th century Australia was on the frontier. And I suppose that has its upside. The focus is hugely increasing our understanding of the frontier and of the police forces and random posses of pastoralists and others who ruled it. The Newcastle University website called Colonial Frontier Massacres in Australia has a somewhat alarming title, but it's an admirable venture nonetheless. And Rachel Perkins' 2022 documentary series is probably going to rebrand frontier conflict forever as the Australian Wars. Now, this is all going to mean myth-making. Frontier warfare is poised to get the same patriotic puffery as expeditionary warfare has had to put up with for some time. It will one day become the prologue to our national military story, with all the well-meaning, community-building, patriotic silliness that goes with the evolution of history into heritage. Now, we can't help that happening, and some of you might support it happening. But historians can at least point out the unique nature of Australian inland frontier conflict that becomes obvious if we reflect for just a moment on the contrast with maritime frontier conflict. On the inland, the Indigenous realm was quickly and utterly overwhelmed. It was a holocaust with few parallels. Polynesian and Melanesian societies bent before the storm. Aboriginal societies were broken. On the other side, it was different too, wasn't it? Settlers in the colonial state took and held territory in Australia and resisted challenge to their possession with relative ease, only rarely having to mobilise significant military resources. Yeah, there were moments of terror and death for some of the occupiers, but violence between black and white in Australia was a minor drag on the white occupation of the continent. It wasn't much worse than bushfires, transport costs, bank debts, bush ranging, or even labour shortages and high wages. Raids, raids by a dozen Aboriginal men armed with spears and clubs were nowhere near as formidable and had nothing like the effect of a long campaign by, say, hundreds of Maori armed with muskets and cannon and supplied by sea. No Australian town was ever destroyed in an inland frontier conflict as Lavuka in Fiji was in 1844, or Kororarika in New Zealand's North Island the year after. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we're making wars out of nothing. Aboriginal societies were partly destroyed by settler violence, and on occasion by official violence. What I am saying is that I think it's a provincial view, and at worst a form of myth-making, to insist that because other settler societies were founded on evenly balanced frontier struggles, full of heroic battles, then Australia must have been too. Now, why was the imbalance so great in inland frontier conflict in Australia? I think maritime frontier conflict suggests one answer, and maybe looking at other frontiers does as well. 18th and 19th century frontiers were often made 
by collisions between Indigenous people and a couple of colonising powers. Think for a moment about the American Great Lakes region, where French trappers and British settlers both arrived at the same time. Now, inland Australia, of course, wasn't like that at all. There, were no rival there was no rival imperial power here. No colonies planted under a French or Spanish or Russian flag. No need by British settlers and colonial governors to court Australia's indigenous people. No need to make treaties with them. No need to arm them as auxiliaries against the French or Russians or whoever. No rivalry, no alliances, no arms trade, no building up of Aboriginal societies into nations. Anyway, end of lecture on frontier conflict. My book was finally published at the end of 2021. Calling it Australia's Tasman Wars, I think, was probably a mistake, because it just isn't clear what that means. It wasn't a great marketing move, but anyway, I'll be interested to see what reviewers make of it. I'd like to hear from you as well, not so much thinking about the book itself, but what I've tried to draw out of the book and out of the process of writing it this morning. How much do we need more research into the British garrison in Australia? Does gathering together all the conflicts caused by intrusions from Australia and New Zealand, PNG and the Pacific make sense? <coughs> if it does, should we contrast maritime frontier conflict with inland frontier conflict? Let me know what you think, and thank you very much for listening. That's great, very thought-provoking, first thing on a Sunday morning. Um, yes. The good thing is we've got about 10 minutes for questions. So if I could ask you to raise your hand and perhaps stand up and identify yourself. No questions, first up. Yes. I like that. <laughs> must be an early morning team, must not it? <laughs> yeah, interesting. I think it 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 does in that there's the implied arrival of the French. There are many brushes with the French. <coughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really interesting question. What what happens in New Zealand if, if you look at it? militarily from an Australian point of view is that there is lots of jostling and parrying, if you like, with the French in New Zealand. There is some French presence in New Zealand, most notably the settlement at Akaroa, um, which never really got off the ground, but nonetheless it frightened the bejesus out of um, um, administ uh, colonial administrators in Australia and in New Zealand. And Warships were typically sent from Australia um, over to New Zealand to settle local conflicts and also to keep a watch on the French. Um, and there was, uh, for example, when there was, um, um, Jeff, Jeff will remember this because I will have forgotten, um, th there was um, a conflict in the Wairau Valley, um, a massacre. Um, warship went from Sydney in 1843 over to patrol the Cook Strait. Um, its first mission was to zip around the Cook Strait, make sure that um, no one was going to kill anybody else. And, and, and once they were satisfied with that, they then went over and parked themselves off Akaroa for a week and performed military drill and gun drill, just, just to alert the French that we're here. It's okay that you're here, but you're not going to leave this place and you're certainly not going to expand out of it. So, uh, so there's that kind of jostling. Um, and to some extent, the... Um, Marry, oh, oh, I think what's gone down in history is a kind of declaration of independence organised by Busby, the um, administrator sent over from Sydney in the 1830s, was partly inspired by the arrival of a French warship at the Bay of Islands and a desire by Marry not to be ruled by the French, who they didn't know and didn't trust. But if they had to choose, they were certainly going to choose the British, who they had a long relationship, and particularly by British people who were based in Sydney because they knew them very well. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, you could say that in New Zealand there is, uh, there is that aspect. But, but yeah, you make a good point. It isn't, it isn't a, a rival presence. And I don't suppose the French ever um, backed any particularly Maori groups, though. No, that's right. Yeah, you make a good point. Um, they do try and sell muskets in New Zealand, yeah. um, but the Maori don't want French muskets because um, that would require a new calibre of bullet, and they believe that they're not as effective as British muskets, which 
I would defer to someone else here to have a comment on. But uh, yeah, but, but it was interesting that that, that Mary were already brand loyal when it came to their muskets by the end of the 30s. <laughs> no, we're not having French ones go away. American ones, on the other hand, were welcome. Um, a bit of a follow-up, if I might. The, the one piece that I don't think you mentioned is New Caledonia. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. But is there a good synopsis of the imperial rivalry and jostling for between Germany, France, and England in, in our region? Is that sort of made a numbers Yeah. Um, there's a, a a book published in the 1980s. Who's of course the name I cannot remember now. Yeah. I apologise. Um, it'll occur to me just after we've stopped talking. Um, I think it came out in 1980, and it was about the Australian presence in the Pacific and it looked at it from a kind of government and sort of large strategic point of view. It, it wasn't interested in the way that empire seems to work in the Pacific and, and maybe everywhere where our traders and missionaries go first and as they used to say, flag follows trade. Um, but I'm, I'm certainly an overview and looking at New Caledonia, for example, as it bothered people in Australia thinking that, well, we, we already have strong trading relations there and now the French turn up oh okay so London's made a deal um, we we will have New Zealand and the French will have New Caledonia well I guess that's kind of all right assuming that we can continue trading um, and there are local ramifications from that with um, fortifications in Sydney Harbour for example thinking the French now have a, a naval presence within striking distance so we have to I make sure that they were able to, to, to um, do, uh, do something about that. And, we, and also that plays into the relationship with New Zealand in that well, we can't send too many troops to New Zealand because then Sydney will be um, open to attack. Um, but I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that there's a, a, a... There's nothing useful that tells the whole story about this corner of the Pacific and how it was contested for so long because you do need to take it on the various levels from runaway convicts, up to traders, up to missionaries, up to local authorities, and then back to the headquarters in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane. That would be nice if you'd like to write it, I'd read it. Andrew, Craig, thanks very much for that. I, I informed history in that way, uh, that Maritime Frontier, so it was quite revealing. We were talking before, before the conference that we always learn something new, and I've already learned something new, so that's a good start. My question is, the British regular forces that were in New Zealand, including the Royal Navy, how did they view the Australian regulars, colonists, ex-convicts, you know, coming across and volunteering to help them? How were they viewed? Were they seen as serious? Yeah, interesting. On the 1860s, later on, you have to ask Jeff, on the, on the 1840s, they don't have to worry about that in that there is, there is an attempt to send volunteers from Sydney in particular um, in the 1840s to conflict in New Zealand, but the regulars consider that they, that they got it handled. And my, and, and my suspicion is also that, that, uh, that the regulars are pretty... Uh, the ordinary soldiers, of course, is a different question, but um, certainly the officers feel that... that um, Ordinary people from convict colonies are not necessarily to be trusted. They're, are, they, are they loose with their talk and they're loose with their weapons, and they're just going to get us into, into massacres. Um, and, and, and an interesting incident does occur to me that um, in 1840, when the first lieutenant governor, as he was, was sent um, from London via Sydney across to um, the Bay of Islands to um, establish a, a um, a sort of government presence actually in New Zealand. Um, the first conflict was with um, the residents of Wellington who considered themselves at that stage to be residents of a company town, not subject to any government at all. Um, so the Mount of Police went from Auckland down to um, Wellington um, and the locals in Wellington saw them as, I'm um, sort of Mount of Police as brutal, um, oh, what do you call it, brutal thugs as, who were part of a convict system. And these people are used to just chaining up ordinary people just because they were convicts and they've come here to chain us up as well. Yeah, so um, certainly um, um, the um, um, quaint um, South Australian and, and New Zealand happiness with the fact that they've had no 
convicts in their colonies um, was <laughs> is a long-standing failing, and they and they, and they certainly wouldn't have welcomed um, any volunteers coming from New South Wales or Victoria or whatever at that time. Um, and and yeah, yeah, the regulars weren't interested as well. Yeah. Um, and one thing that came out writing my book, I th I think, is that. While while uh, we we don't have, have very good sense of graduation, uh, um, um, different levels when we talk of wars, maybe, and people have written about New Zealand wars early on anyway as a war like a war, like oh, like your aim is to kill the enemy. But in the 1840s, it certainly wasn't. The aim was to um, um, besiege Maori stockades um, and not kill everybody in them. Hope hope that they were going to give up. Um, maybe kill a few because, and, and, and then the rest can go because they're British subjects. Are you, you, are you not meant to massacre them? And to go back to your question, if you have a bunch of convicts there as volunteers or whatever, then that might be what they would do. Yeah. Thank you. Brent Taylor, wouldn't it be just on the, on the nature of the frontier of the wars, um, wouldn't it be true to, to, uh, to see that the Maoris are? fundamentally organised differently to the Aboriginals, for instance, and so would be the, the um, Fijians. They're yeah, yeah, yeah. like the Maori, so they've got huge stockades, they do military manoeuvres, they right. get stuck into each other all the time anyway. Yeah. Um, so they're actually a much more formidable target. For yeah, that's right. Yeah. Take over. Yeah, yeah, that's certainly true. Um, it, it's certainly true when it, when it comes to battle, in that the idea of battle is common throughout the Pacific. And, the idea, and as you say, yeah, stockade sieges, yeah, that are, are the sort of common currency too. But but I do wonder, um, what if the what if the French had come to Tasmania or Victoria, um, would they not have um, cultivated um, Australian Aborigines to fight in a different way? I, I, I mean, roll them in a colonial <coughs> regiment. This is how you fight, and you might have had a situation like you had in India, where there are where, where there are native peoples with. I'm not only really different military traditions, but uh, are different levels of, of, of learning the new ways and, go, and going into. I, I'm actually I'm, I'm, I'm doing it now. I'm, I'm going into it and thinking, well, you know, if we stand here, if we, if we fire the muskets that, we, that we've been trained to fire, then, then the result is going to be different. I think just the issuing of muskets themselves would have been different. But yeah, your fundamental point is right. Uh, the idea of toe to toe, face to face battle is a Pacific thing. It's a European thing. Yeah. Craig, I'm always intrigued in terms of you mentioned that the Maoris had muskets and cannon. Yeah, what was the source and funding and the acquisition of these arms? Yeah, yeah, that's that's um trading. That I, I, um, the um, timber, the flax, whatever. Um, um, I, 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 the economy works pretty much that that uh, a, 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 um, trading representatives will leave Sydney, they'll go and. Um, have a relationship or, or build on an existing relationship with a with a with a Maori people and a certain number of chiefs. Um, the Maori will agree, or, or, or the chiefs, or the people in power will agree that their slaves will organise um, the flax to be all bundled up, or the timber to be chopped down and carted down to the water, or whatever. And that stuff goes across to Sydney and then gets sent. Um, I think I guess timber and flax went over to. London, and I would guess that um, other stuff, um, uh, um, things that were described as curios or, or um, other items, um, sandalwood or whatever, if, if you're in a different part of the Pacific, was going to go to China in particular. Um, and, and there were really big profits to be made out of that, and trade muskets were just being pumped out from Birmingham or whatever, they were pretty cheap. So it, it worked reasonably well. So when people talk about a musket trade, yeah, you'd be quite right. It's a musket flax trade, or it's a musket sandalwood trade, or it's a musket timber trade, or whatever. But it worked, and apparently worked really well. But what we really need is for an economic historian to dig into this and work out, well, who's making money, who's not making money out of it? Um, what changes did it bring to Maori societies? <laughs> what economic advantages did it bring to Sydney, the Hunter River, or whatever, yeah, at the time. Last question, sir. Yeah. Ben Van Acker from Sunbury. Uh, just a quick question on, uh, I was fascinated by the, the domestic frontier mm -hmm. sort of war. Would you make a distinction between farmers and constabulary 
and military response or military strategy? I guess so. I, 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 would, I would implicitly. Um, constabulary, though, are an interesting mix, aren't they? Um, so I, I'm not sure of the case later on in, in our period, but in, in, in the, in the uh, start again, earlier in the 19th century, they're British soldiers who are, who are paid more and put in the constabulary, but they have to operate at a magistrate's discretion, don't they? So it's interesting, um, presumably, the, the mounted police are using semi-military ideas. And I would guess, given, given the large numbers of, of former soldiers who are convicts in New South Wales, it wouldn't surprise me that, that to some extent they use it too. But yeah, the um, aims are different and the styles are different. And, there, and there's more negotiation and sort of betrayals of trust and things like that and misunderstandings that, that, that are going to occur in an informal setting. And maybe also in that informal setting there's more um, un, unregulated or, or seriously mistaken killings that, that people didn't necessarily want to happen. I mean, I assume that much of the point of, of any military training is not only to start I'm so that people learn when to start killing, but also when to stop killing. It's, it's an instrument that, that you want to be able to turn on and off to a rational purpose. And that's going to be very difficult when you're dealing with men who are heated up, afraid, feel that they are justified, that someone's done some terrible thing to them, and they just want to kill people. It's going to be very hard to control them. So yeah, oh, yeah you're right. I'm flummoxed my way through that. Yeah, 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 there's going to be a big difference, isn't there? Thank you. Thank you very much. No,